Welcome to the International School of Tailoring. My name is Reza and this is going to be your 16th lesson of our How to Make a Bespoke Jacket series. In the previous lesson, we constructed the canvas of our jacket. In this lesson, we're going to mark stitch all the panels of our Pagoda model to get them ready for assembly. Mark stitching is one of the most important and time-consuming parts of tailoring. Whenever we chalk out our pattern on our fabric, we need some way to transfer those chalk lines through both layers and have them visible on both the right and the wrong side of the fabric. And mark stitching does exactly that. The sooner you do it, the better, because faded chalk lines can cause disasters. Now, before we begin, I'm gonna give you a word of caution about mark stitching, and after that, we're gonna do all the panels one by one. You ready? Let's go. All right, before we mark stitch our panels, let me remind you of something extremely important in regards to mark stitching. The quality of your mark stitching is going to be determined by three factors. Factor number one is going to be the quality of your thread. Mark stitching requires a thicker and more fibrous thread so that the thread can stay longer into the fabric and has a better grip. Factor number two is going to be your bite size. What was the bite size again? Well, that's the distance between the point where your needle goes in and where your needle goes out. The smaller that distance, the smaller your bite size, the bigger that distance, the bigger your bite size. Mark stitching requires the smallest possible bite size. Why? Well, the bigger the bite size, the more fabric is showing and therefore the more grip you have. And so when you're working on your garment, that thread is gonna come out very easily. But when the bite size is very small, look at that. It's just impossible to take that out. Now, the third factor is how much thread you leave when you have done your mark stitching. You need to leave three millimeters, which is one eighth of an inch, so that again, you don't have a lot of thread showing because again, more thread, more grip, and voila. That comes out very quickly. But here, it's a lot shorter, it's three millimeters, and that requires a few more rubs for the thread to come out. So it stays in a bit longer. All right, before we mark stitch our panels, let's go through a few very important things. If you've already made our traditional model, you can skip this part and go to the next chapter. And I say chapter, not lesson. If not, let's go through them so that you're aware of them. First of all, make sure that you have the right setup. What do I mean? Well, on my left hand side, I have all the panels that need mark stitching. In the middle, I'm gonna be doing all the mark stitching and then once I'm done, I'm gonna roll up the panels and put them to my right. This is a very important habit to develop because it's gonna improve your efficiency, your accuracy, you can keep track of your work and you'll be a lot more productive. So don't have the panels all over the place. After that, make sure that your fabric has no creases or wrinkles. If it has some, just simply run the iron through it and make sure it's laying flat in front of you. Also, make sure that you're using the right thread. If you've purchased our improvers bundle, not only will you have the same fabric as I have, but included in that bundle will also be our beautiful marking thread. At the back of this thread, you have this little flap that says number five betweens needle. If you fold the flap over, you have two beautiful needles waiting for you. Once you've taken them out, simply put them back into your cotton and put it on your board. If, however, you don't have our marking thread, not to worry at all. All you need is a slightly thicker thread that's a bit more fibrous than the average machine thread. That fibrous quality will ensure that the thread stays longer into the fabric. If you can't find a thicker thread, again, do not worry. All you have to do is to double your machine thread, then thread your needle with a doubled thread, and then double your thread again. So every time you put the needle in and out, you're putting four strands of thread into your fabric. That should help the threads to stay in your fabric a little longer. If you're working on a velvet or some corduroys or moleskin, anything with a pile, please make sure that you put a very heavy iron on top of your panels as you're mark stitching, or perhaps a few pins here and there. If you are putting pins in your material, please make sure that the pins don't gather up your material and distort it because you don't want to be mark stitching distorted panels. So if you've understood all of that, let's go ahead and mark stitch our panels. 
Thread your needle and double your thread. This is very important. After that, it's time to make sure that all the outer edges of your panels are matching. If for whatever reason you can't get all the edges to match, the edges that do not have any inlay have priority. First, match those and then try to get the rest matching. Whenever you have inlay, it's really the line on the surface of your fabric that matters, not the edge of the inlay per se. So start with the net lines and then try to get everything as closely together as possible. Now, once you've done that, it's time to mark stitch. It doesn't really matter which line you begin with as long as you do it correctly. Remember, a straighter line can have a slightly bigger stitch length, but anywhere where you have handling, so a lot of friction, or you have curves like the front edge, or you have shorter lines, you need to have a denser stitch length. Okay, so let's begin. I'm going to start right on the intersection of the gorge and the brake line, which is right here. Small bite size, stitch length of two and a half centimeters, that's one inch, and let's go. Cut through and move over to the next line. Starting from the neck point, here we have a curve, so my stitch length is going to be smaller. And as you're doing a shorter stitch length, make sure to leave some slack in your thread because once you've cut through the thread, you don't want to have just a little bit left because you still need to open up your layers and cut in between them as well. Here we have an intersection, so mark that accurately. Make sure it goes in and in again so that when you turn it over, you have this nice T-shape. That should indicate exactly where you have your intersection. So here for the peak, we have a corner. You have to make sure that all the corners are mark stitched perfectly. What do I mean? So I've got one bite going into the corner right here. The other one is going to go in from the opposite direction. When I take my thread out like so and I flip it over, you can see a perfect corner. This is very important. You need the corner of the neck point, the shoulder point, your outbreast welt, your flaps, and any other area at the top of your peak, because it's important to know where these corners are. If one of the mark stitches go out and you don't know where the corner is, you can't assume by just simply extending the rest of the lines that that's exactly the location of your point. So please develop the habit of getting the points right. Now on the lapel, we have a slight curve. It's important to get the shape of this curve right. So I'm going to reduce my stitch length to make sure that I have the character of this curve correctly marked. Moving over to the front edge and the bottom. So as I'm approaching this curve, I'm going to reduce my stitch length and then go back to the normal. When I say stitch length, I don't mean bite size. So the bite size stays the same. It should be as small as you can. The stitch length is really the distance between the bites. Now let's do the center front. Starting at the top, I'm going all the way to the bottom. And now the underarm seam. Here we have a step, so you simply mark stitch from the top right to the step and then continue from the top of this step all the way to the bottom there. Again, here we have a curve, and so make sure that you have a smaller stitch length and don't just plunk the thread, you know, in four stitches. Now we're going to do the shoulder line. As I mentioned with the corners, we need to make sure that we mark this neck point as accurately as we can. So I already have a thread going in there, so now I have to start again from the neck point and move towards the shoulder line. When I turn my fabric over, you can see a perfect point here. You should see that corner. That's very important. Chest line. So now we're going to do the outbreast weld. Make sure that you get all the corners right. Put a few stitches here because it's a short line. And that should be it. And now the front dart. So we need to make sure that we mark the top point of the dart, the intake point, and the bottom. We can do that by doing a plus shape or a T shape to indicate the beginning, the middle, and the end. Also, note that I haven't really marked the actual legs of the dart and then mark stitched on top of those. A lot of beginners tend to mark the dart legs and then mark stitch on top of those, but they fail to understand that those are the sewing lines. And so when you're taking a dart out, what you're doing is you're folding the dart along 
the center line and then you're marking the dart legs and then you're sewing through it. When you have the mark stitches going through that, it's very annoying to sew, first of all, on that line, but also if you've done a machine stitch, for example, those machine stitches will catch the mark stitches and it becomes impossible to take them out. So all you need is the center line of the dart, the top point, the intake point, and the bottom. And now for the top point, I'm just simply going across so that when I'm done, it looks something like this, like a T-shape. Now I've marked a line here. You can mark stitch this if you want, but you don't really have to. This is a line that I usually use when I'm cutting out the canvas just to have a reference of where the intake point is for the canvas. But really, I'm not going to mark stitch this at the moment. The flap, hip line, our button, and our front pitch. We have a very short line here, so make sure to at least get four or three stitches in there. That means you have to have a very small stitch length. Before you open up your fabric and cut through the thread, what you have to do is first of all check your work. Flip everything over and make sure that your bite sizes are small, all your lines are accurately marked, all the curves have a shorter stitch length, all the corners are perfectly visible. Just go through the lines, shoulder lines, armhole, front pitch, out breast well, chest line, break line, center front line, the gorge, the curve of the lapel, the front edge, the bottom, underarm seam. We have the pocket mouth that goes into the step right here. We have the front dart, we have the flap, we have the front pitch right on the body, and we have the hip line. If your work looks like this, then you're good to go. If not, ask yourself why, what's the difference, what have I done, what haven't I done, and correct it. Another thing I'd like to mention is, notice that here I have a small gap between the brake line, the front edge, and the first button. It's good not to have all those threads bunch up in one point, because once you've cut through them, it becomes a blobby piece and you can't really accurately mark what the actual line is until you take a few mark stitches out. So a little gap there is okay. Please don't think that if you double your stitches, as in put 20 more stitches on each line, you have a more beautiful or more accurate jacket. Mark stitching should be very practical. You want to mark as many lines as you can with as few stitches possible. You have to remember that those mark stitches will have to come out once you're done with the jacket. If you're working in a workshop, you're perhaps mark stitching for someone else. And if that person gets a heart attack by seeing how many mark stitches they have to take out, then maybe they're going to manage their time differently so that they spend less time on the quality of the garment and more time on taking those bloody stitches out. People do, after all, get paid by the hour in our industry. So, time to cut through. It's always best to open up your fabric parallel to the lines that you're going to cut through. It's very difficult to open up the fabric against a vertical line because what will happen is the front stitch is going to become very long, the thread of that stitch, and the one behind it is going to be very short. And so you end up with very inconsistent trimming. Also, try to always open up the fabric so that you can see the inside of it. Don't try to open it up like this and try to cut through because the risk of cutting into the fabric will increase. I'm using a beautiful curved surgical scissor. It has round points. It allows me to simply go into the fabric without worrying that I'm going to be poking the fabric or cutting into the fabric. But also it has a curve, so it gives me great access into, you know, further into the fabric if I have to. Once I'm done cutting through, I will have to trim everything to three millimeters. And so again, that curve is very handy because I can just go like this over the fabric and trim all these threads to a shorter length. So I'm going to start with the front edge and the bottom and work my way towards the rest of the panel. Now you might be wondering, how much do I open the fabric and then cut through the thread? Well, it's very simple. We need to have these threads end up as a length of roughly three millimeters. So when I'm opening up the fabric, I will open the fabric until I can see about six or seven millimeters of thread. And then when I cut right in the middle of it, 
I have three millimeters on either side. That's one eighth of an inch, okay? So once you're done cutting through your thread, this is how your mark stitches should look like. It has a great overview of what all the lines are, where they start, where they stop. There isn't too many of them, and at the same time, they're not too long. All of them are about three millimeters, so that's one eighth of an inch long. On the other side, however, we still have very long threads. So I'm gonna go ahead and trim them short to three millimeters so that this side also looks like this. So once you've done some trimming, it becomes very difficult to see exactly what lines you still have to trim. Simply grab your panel, give it a good shake, allow everything to fall off, and try to keep it on your board. Don't do it on the floor, it just makes such a mess. And then simply bring them all together as much as you can, put it in a bin, and the remainder you can take off with a lint roller, or if you don't have a lint roller, you can bring everything to the side with your ruler and remove it like that. So I've missed a few, let's trim those as well. Now that you're done trimming your threads, it's time to give your fabric, along with the threads, some steam. Steam helps the threads to expand so that they have a better grip as they are staying in your fabric. And that should be enough. You don't really need a very heavy iron for this. You know, a domestic steam iron is perfect for the job. Don't strain your arms unnecessarily. Now, let's continue with the next panel, which is going to be the side body. So I'm going to roll this up. Put it to my right, take the side body out, and do exactly the same things that I did on the fore part, except we have different lines here. So, underarm seam, hem, side seam. Here we have this line, that's where our vent is going to be, our side vent. We have our hip line, our chest line, top of the side seam, and our side body side. So, according to the same principles and the same rules, I'm going to mark stitch these lines. So before you cut through, flip the work over and have a look. Have you mark stitched all the lines? Is everything in place? Do you have a small bite size? I still need to do the top of the side seam. I tend to forget that always. So I'm gonna do that and then cut through, trim, steam, and move on to the back. Okay, so that's the side body panel done. Let's roll it up and continue with the back. For the back, we are going to baste with our basting cotton, our basting thread, the center back seam. If you've got yourself a bundle, your basting thread will be included in that bundle. If not, it's going to be a thinner thread than the one with which you're mark stitching. So I'm going to first baste the center back and then I'm going to go through the lines that we're going to mark stitch. Thread your needle and put a knot right at the end and then begin a quarter of an inch, that's about five millimeters, above your nape. That's the point where the back neck and the center back meet. Fasten on once, twice, and with a stitch length of three eighths, that's one centimeters, go all the way down to the edge of your fabric. So when we reach the end, fasten off once, twice, and a cool trick that some of the tailors do when they are trying to work fast is to instead of reaching out for the scissor, they simply put the thread over their middle finger, put some tension on the thread and cut it out like that. If your thread is soft and it breaks easily, which your basting thread should do, you can do that. But if it's a machine thread, impossible. You'll probably cut your finger or whatsoever. Now, time to do the mark stitching. Here we have a side vent. All the other lines, so the back neck, back shoulder, back side, back pitch, top of side seam, side seam, chest line, our vent and hip line and bottom line are going to be mark stitched as they are. But the actual vent fold is not going to be mark stitched right on the line, but three eighths behind it. So what I have to do is to take my ruler 
and draw a line which is 3 8 that's one centimeter behind my vent line so right where our vent starts below that is going to be this line and that's the line we're going to mark stitch why are we going to do that well it's very simple this chalk line represents the edge of our pattern when we are sewing our side seam we are going to sew one centimeter or three eighths behind that line so if we are going to sew a centimeter or three eighths behind that line like that the continuation of our sewing line is going to fall three eighths behind the edge of our pattern so when our vent folds as we have sewn the side seams and is creased up like that it's really this edge that is going to be the crease edge of our vent okay that's all I'm now going to mark stitch all these lines based on the same principles as I just explained and make sure to get all the nice curves the corners and all of that and that should be the back done and we can continue with the top sleeve all the way up to here I've mark stitched on the actual edge of the pattern I am now reaching the actual starting point of the vent and so I'm going to switch to that line behind the edge of my pattern now here we have a step and that step creates a corner the corner that is created by the intersection between the side seam and the top of the side seam balance mark you do not need to mark stitch that corner that step simply indicates that that is where our seam allowance is going to be taken off from so if you create a corner right here which accidentally I have it won't have any purpose the main thing is to know that that step is 3 8 and that means that therefore that our seam allowance is 3 8 before we cut through the fabric flip it over have a look is everything done well if so time to cut trim and steam two important things first of all when you baste your center back you should really make sure that the basting that you've done is not tight at all so if you move with your fingers over your threads there shouldn't be too much tension on them you should be able to kind of like move them sideways now at the same time they shouldn't be that loose so that when you're trying to open up these layers that they completely open up with a big gap in between them you'll be able to tell whether your stitches are tight if you see that the thread has been drawing the fabric together and so you've ended up with these waves right on the stitching line okay that's one thing now the other thing generally when you're mark stitching and you have two rows of stitching or multiple rows you should be very careful not to have the top fabric moved so that a bubble is trapped as you're mark stitching what that means is that once the stitching is cut through this will simply move over and one of your panels is going to be bigger than the other one so always make sure that all your panels are flat as you're mark stitching them so let's roll this up and continue with the top sleeve now on the top sleeve we have this very long forearm seam that doesn't have inlay so the first thing I'm going to do is to match that and then try to get the rest matching like so now we're going to do the hind arm the hem we're going to do the chest line this line you can ignore then we have the top sleeve run again we have two small steps right here and right here you don't need to make a corner in those steps that's just an indication of how big the seam allowance is going to be all you have to do is to mark stitch the top sleeve run on its own now then we have the top pitch and then we have the front pitch so here I've marked it and it may be a bit confusing but what you're going to mark stitch is this diagonal line up to here and then from here towards the straight line so what I have in this area is not relevant it's just this line and this line flip over have a look is everything marked correctly do you have a small bite size and if that's the case let's cut trim and steam 
We're going to do exactly the same thing as we did on the top sleeve. We're going to do the hind arm, the hem, chest line, and the under sleeve run. We have no pitch marks here, so that's fine. And this little mark you can ignore. Let's flip it over and have a look. Hind arm, hem, chest line, under sleeve run. One thing that I'd like to mention is that if you are struggling with having a small bite, there are a few reasons to that. So first of all, if the surface of your board is very soft, your needle will tend to go really deep into the surface of the melton or felt or whatever you have on your board. And as you're trying to lift up the needle and bring it back, it will make a very large bite and uh, it's going to make it super difficult for you to really have a tiny amount of pickup. Whereas if you have a harder surface, so for example, let's say I have this ruler underneath there, my needle won't go any further than the fabric. So it will instantly pick up the fabric without going into the board and then coming out and then going over the fabric again. So the bite will be a lot smaller. But the other very important aspect is your needle technique. So whenever you're sewing, you should have your left or right hand, whichever hand that may be, in front of the needle. And if you want to take a small bite, you should have your index finger as close to the needle as possible. Why? If I take up a little bit of fabric and my finger is very close to the needle, I can't lift the fabric that far up. So I'm forced to make the tiniest bite that my needle can pick up. Whereas if I have a big distance between my needle and my finger and I'm trying to pick up the fabric, look at what happens. I can't really control the amount of fabric that I'm picking up because my finger is just too far away from the needle. So keep your index finger close and that should help you to have a very small bite. I'm going to cut through the threads, trim them and steam and then do the last panel which is our under color. That's the under sleeve done and now it's time to do the last panel which is our self under color. Now we don't need to mark a lot on this panel because we're going to position our canvas on it later on. So the only thing that we need to mark stitch is going to be the position of our shoulder. All the other ones we can leave free. And that's it. So let's bring all our panels together, put this on top and take it to the next stage. Whenever you're mark stitching, make small bites. And when you're done cutting through the thread, trim the remaining thread to a length of three millimeters. That's one eighth of an inch. After that, apply some steam to allow the fibers of the thread to expand for better grip. Anytime you're mark stitching a long straight line, you can increase the distance of your stitches a little bit more to speed up your work. But if you're mark stitching curves or an area where there's going to be friction as you're working on it, like the shoulders, the armhole, the sleeves, reduce the distance of your stitching for accuracy. Now, if you're an apprentice and mark stitching is given to you as a responsibility, please don't see it as something beneath you. It's the perfect opportunity for you to study the lines of that pattern, even if you think that the lines of that pattern are bad. It's still a study. So master it as even some of the most experienced tailors fail to do it correctly. Now, some of you may not have easy access to all the materials that you see me use in these lessons, and that can be very annoying. If anything, whenever you're using different materials, because of the behavior of those materials, evaluation becomes a struggle. And when you're trying to learn something, it's very important to have something as a reference that you can compare your work with. Now, for that reason, we have assembled two bundles, that's four, but we have only done two, that you can purchase from our website. Simply click on the link in the description of this video and treat yourself to a bundle. My name is Reza, this was today's lesson, and I look forward to seeing the next one. Take care. Thank <laughs> you.